we're going to continue with some of the concepts that we introduced in the letter of Galatians, especially the first and second chapters. In this series called Peter was known because he was found out, he was discovered to be acting hypocritically. The big picture here is Paul warning us about following personalities. That's the, the main idea, is we should be warned about that, which is a valid thing and a thing that's very real even today. And then um, in the last part, we looked at how the, the first and second chapters of Galatian, Galatians, Paul is actually recalling the events of Acts chapter 15 when he took uh, with him a number of false teachers to Jerusalem where they got a good shellacking at the hands of the rest of the apostles and um, came back with the way to deal with this, how we're going to teach about the inclusion of the Gentiles in a positive way from the Old Testament and what we're going to do about these false teachers, how we will cut off their influence. That's the meaning, uh, or I should say that's the background, and that was the last lesson. Today we're looking at the fact that the apostles sinned. When we talk about Peter was known, Peter is, of course, an apostle. He's the first one to speak up. That's why Jesus said to, to you, I give the keys to the kingdom. He's the first one to speak up in Acts 2 and in Acts 10 and um, in Acts 15 as well. But even he sinned. So this is the warning. Uh, here we go. Try again. This is the warning. The big picture of the letter is that Galatia should follow suit. They need to cut off those who are teaching error, especially this particular error. And they need to be careful about following personalities instead of following Christ through his word. But the first chapter laid out Principles, we talked about that as well. The first chapter of Galatians laid out principles that are the principles that govern everything else that's written in that letter. So that's the way that the structure goes up to this point. Now, we read last time in Acts 15, covered that, they had a doctrinal unity. That there was no question about whether the Gentiles would be included or whether they had to be circumcised. That was never a question in the mind of any apostle. Certainly, Paul never taught such a thing from the time that he received the gospel in Acts 9. And Peter was also told plainly about this in Acts 10 and relate it to the rest in Acts 11. So from the start, this was never a question. That's not the issue. However, despite this fact and this clarity and the things that can be easily demonstrated from the book of Acts, some of these apostles sinned after the fact. And this is the thing that Paul is capturing in Galatians 1 and Galatians 2. When Peter and James spoke, and they were, you know, they were... Uh, some of the leading voices there in Acts 15. When they spoke, they spoke as apostles. They were inspired. That's why it's written down in the book of the Acts. This is the thing God wanted to have written down that they said. But their actions did not follow suit with the, what they said in this particular case that's recorded in Galatians 1 and 2. And this happens sometimes, that people who are God's chosen vessels for putting forth the truth in this world do so, but then sometimes they also don't do so, and sometimes their actions don't accord with their deeds. And I appreciate Andrew's prayer in that vein. We've got to beware that, and that's one of the things Paul's getting at. But when we look back you know, 
Oops. When we look back in Acts 15 at what it was that they said, I guess I want it to be fairly clear that they were leaders. They were speaking the truth. They were an influence for good. Uh, Peter's speech is recorded in Acts 15, um, verses 7 through 11, where he reminds them, In early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us and made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. So he said things that were rather clear. When he stood up, it was a reminder of what they had been told five chapters earlier. And James, when he gets up, is recorded in the 13, uh, let's see, down through about 21, it looks like. Yeah, James is recorded in 13 to 21 here. But he also made mention in the 14th verse, Simeon, using Peter's Jewish name, has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. So he begins to give Old Testament passages that can be used, that can be interpreted, understood for the inclusion of the Gentiles. So Peter said, God included them. We know that. He made it clear to us. And James said, we also see that the prophets agree with this. It's consistent with the rest of the Bible. Here are some verses to consider. For example, But when you get to Galatians chapter 2, with Paul writing about this to the church of Galatia somewhat later, you read in the 12th and 13th verses, before certain men came from James, Peter was eating with the Gentiles, but when they came, or when they arrived, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. So the record shows Peter and James, who had spoken prominently in Acts chapter 15, are now, in Galatians 2, the main influence in hypocrisy on this matter that they spoke about inspired by the Holy Spirit in Acts 15. They're the main hypocrites. It's Peter who's doing this, eating with the Gentiles before these men from James show up. James sends, uh, you know, these people from Judea down uh, to where Peter is at, and Peter, on receiving them, pretends you know, that he doesn't eat with the Gentiles. And when he does this, and these are friends of James who come from Judea, then you find the 13th verse, the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, even Barnabas. Well, they absolutely knew better than this. There's no, there could be no question that they knew this was not the right thing to be doing. This is not the way to be acting. They had been the inspired vessels of God for the things that are recorded in Acts 15. It's their words by which God expressed himself about how to teach on the inclusion of Gentiles. So, yeah, they certainly are accountable. They certainly know better. This is no uh, rookie mistake, you know. First time out, young men didn't, didn't know better, didn't realize what they were saying. That's not what's happening. It's just 
hypocrisy. They, they know better than to act this way, but they're doing it. And then, as Paul rebukes them, it's Galatians chapter 2, he said at verse 11, when Cephas, that's Paul, Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he was known. Now, my translation says he stood condemned, but that's not accurate. Uh, well, that's not accurate. He was known. He was found out. He was discovered is what the meaning is. That verb can be used for condemn, but it, in order to do so, it has to be in a legal context with the, you know, the thing that is being condemned uh, or the, the charge against them, and that's not what's happening here. It's saying that he's known, he's recognized for what he really is. It became clear that he was a hypocrite. That's what it means. It was clear because, well, he used to eat with the Gentiles until a certain set of fellas from a certain other apostle in a certain location, Jerusalem, came down. Then he wouldn't eat with the Gentiles anymore. Then Paul withstood him to his face. And the 14th verse of Galatians 2, when I saw their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of everyone, if you, though you are a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? Now, what's happening here, as Paul says these things, is Paul is not giving him anything that is new. In fact, Paul is not giving him his own thoughts. What Paul is doing is feeding back to him his own words. Paul is using Peter's words to condemn what Peter is doing. Because they're not Peter's words, right? They're God's words. The power is in God. But that's what's happening how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? Remember, we said in Acts 15 was the record of what Peter said, and among the things that he said was there in the 10th verse, why are you placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear in reference to the law of Moses? Placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples is forcing them, right? Right? That's what Peter, uh, that's what Paul is telling him. Why, well, this is what you said in Acts 15 10. And then in Galatians 2, the next thing he says to him is 15th verse We ourselves are Jews by birth and not sinners from among the Gentiles, not Gentile sinners. And I noticed that my translation actually ended the quotation at verse 14 of Galatians 2, and I don't know why they would do that when verse 15 very obviously is Peter and Paul. We ourselves are Jews by birth. He can't be using the royal we writing to the people in Galatia who are explicitly Gentiles, not Jews by birth. So this is still what he's saying to Peter in front of everybody. And it also very clearly comes from Peter's own words. So we have every reason to believe this is the quotation of the rebuke that Paul gave to Peter. We are Jews by birth, not Gentile sinners, which is also what Peter had said in Acts chapter 10 when he went to the household of a Roman, Cornelius, which he didn't want to do, you may recall, if, if you know Acts 10, and if not, you can go back and read it, but we'll say he didn't want to go to the house of a Gentile, and God actually gave him a vision and repeated it three times over, saying what God has cleansed, you must not call common or profane, unclean. <laughs> 
And then he went to the household of Cornelius. And as he explained why he came, because of a direct revelation of the Spirit that he should go and he should be among them, he said to them in Acts 10, 28, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or visit anyone of another nation. That's what Paul said in Galatians 2, 15. We are Jews by birth, not Gentile sinners. It's exactly what Peter said. And yet... Galatians 2.16. And yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. That is the law of Moses. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law of Moses, because by works of the law no one will be justified. So, I'm sorry, Galatians 2.16, he said, A person is not justified by works of the law, that means the law of Moses, but through faith in Jesus Christ. Back in Acts 15, when Peter was speaking at verse 9 and reminded everybody of what had been said in Acts 11 and what had happened in Acts 10, He said, God made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. That's Galatians 2.16. Justified, not by Moses, but through faith. It's his words back to him. He himself said this. And the conclusion of what Peter said in Acts 15 is especially poignant. Peter spoke in Acts 15, recorded verses 7 through 11. But I would grab the 10th and 11th verses here. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we rather believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. We, the apostles, also are not being saved because of our Jewish background, our keeping of the law of Moses, but rather through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they who are not Jews, the Gentiles, will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus apart from the law of Moses. It couldn't be clearer. That's what he's saying. So what Peter is hearing when Paul speaks to him is only what he himself said and taught by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Why did they do this? Well, Galatians 2.12 said they feared the circumcision, the party of the circumcision. That is to say, those who were Jewish or had been Jewish, who were Christians and part of the church, they had an influence. They had a power that Peter and James seemed to fear. How do people who know better fall into this kind of behavior? Well, it's through fear. It's through fear. They're afraid of something. If there is a fourth lesson, we're currently on number two, but if there's a fourth lesson, it will be, why is the circumcision party so scary? I'm not sure there will be a fourth lesson that may not be technically entirely within the domain of the letter of Galatians. But if so, that's what it'll be. We could talk about that at another time. But now, I want to go back to Galatians 1 and Galatians 2 and demonstrate what Paul intended He's a sneaky one. 
He gave us Galatians 1, 6 through 10, to lay down principles that we talked about in our last lesson. Little did you know, when you first read these, that he was about to use them as the outline for what happened with Peter. That's what's happening. Remember the principle from Galatians 1, 7. There is not another gospel. There's only one truth. Whatever people say, there's only one gospel, there's only one truth. Remember that principle? Why did he say that in Galatians 1, 7? Well, it's true. Yeah, it's true. But why? Because there isn't another truth. Galatians 2.1, after 14 years, that is 14 years after I became an apostle by direct revelation from Jesus, I went up to Jerusalem. 14 years he had the gospel separate from the rest of the apostles. I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation and set before them the gospel that I proclaim among the nations. He only went to Jerusalem because of a revelation, as in God told him, yep, do this, because God knew he was going to be writing Acts 15. Peter, uh, Paul didn't know that at the time, in the first and second verses of Acts 15, but that's what was going to happen, and he wouldn't have gone if he hadn't been told by God to go, because he didn't need to confer with Jerusalem. He already had the truth. He already had the gospel. There isn't another gospel. He said, though, at the third verse of chapter 2, I'm sorry, it's the second verse of chapter 2 of Galatians. I set before them the gospel I proclaim among the Gentiles, though I did this privately before those who seemed to be influential, in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. That's interesting. He set forth what he was doing very plainly, but he did this first privately before the influential members of the church in Jerusalem, to make sure that they were also on the same page. He didn't want this to be done publicly as some question or issue or problem that would start false teaching and spread it in the churches with the authority of Jerusalem. He talked to them first privately to make sure that they were doing right and that there was nothing to these false teachers who had come down. They hadn't been sent by Jerusalem. It wasn't coming from Jerusalem. That's not because he apologizes for the gospel. It's because he wants to be sure that the gospel is what gets proclaimed, and that he's not responsible for the proclamation of error in the hearing of the church. But when he arrived in Jerusalem, as is recorded in Acts 15 as well, it said they were received gladly by the apostles and elders when he and Barnabas arrived. In Galatians 2, verse 6, he said, those who seemed to be influential added nothing to me. He doesn't mean by this, well, I didn't need them. That didn't, you know, that meant nothing. He means when he got there and they saw what he was teaching, it was not different from what they were teaching. They had nothing to add to his doctrine. It was the same, is what he means by this. It's not another gospel. It's the same. That's the first principle. The other thing over there in Galatians 1, that verse 7, that he said was, though there's not a different gospel, there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. So that principle is that some there are some people who do teach error 
And this he covered in chapter 2 at verse 4 when he said, actually even verse 3, even Titus who was with me was not forced to be circumcised though he was a Greek. This thing about forcing people to be circumcised is because of false brothers, verse 4, secretly brought in who slipped in to spy out our freedom we have in Christ Jesus so that they might bring us into slavery. To them we did not yield in submission even for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. Man, don't you wish that this is what would happen in the churches today? I do. Not for a moment did we put up with that. There are some who would trouble you, and we put up with it for not a minute. Not at all. And this trouble is actually a word borrowed from Acts 15. <laughs> James himself said in Acts 15, 19, we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God. Let's not make trouble for them. That's the trouble of Galatians 1, 7. There are some who trouble you. Acts 15, 19, James said we shouldn't trouble those Gentiles who turn to God. Acts 15, 24, in their letter the apostles wrote, some persons have gone out from us and troubled you, to whom we gave no such instructions. That's where they got this word from. That's why he said it in Galatians 1.7. Galatians 1.8, he gave another principle. Don't join the apostles in sin. Even if we... Or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel to you contrary to the one we preach to you. Let him be accursed. If we, that is the apostles, or an angel from heaven preach a contrary gospel, let him be accursed. Don't join them in doing what is wrong. Galatians 1.8. Why say that? Well, in part, Galatians 2.6 because those from those who seem to be influential, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those, I say, who seemed influential added nothing to me. What they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. What's that? It's a quote of Peter, Acts 10, verse 34, when he appeared before the household of Cornelius and said, Truly, I now understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him is acceptable to him. That's what Peter said. Whether we or an angel from heaven should say something different. He said, you know, whoever they are, apostles makes no difference. God shows no partiality, Peter and remember at 2.11, when Peter arrived, Paul opposed him. He was condemned. He was known. He was figured out. Who? Peter, the apostle. Why say, even if we or an angel from heaven preach a gospel contrary, let him be accursed? Because Peter did exactly that. That's why. And what's the right response? It's oppose him to his face. 1 Timothy 5.20 for those elders who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all so that the rest may stand in fear. That's what you do. That's the right response. And Peter was persisting in sin. Remember Galatians 1, verse 10, Paul had said, uh, or asked these questions, rhetorical questions, am I now seeking the approval of man or am I seeking the approval of God? Whose commendation am I looking for? Who should be happy with me and with whom should I have approval, acceptance? Am I looking for that from my fellow man or am I looking for that from God? Well, the, the principle is we should look for that from God. But what you see in Galatians 2.12 is that Peter did this, James, the men with him, the rest of the Jews and Barnabas, they all did this because they feared the circumcision party. Who are the circumcision party? That's men, not God. When they did this, what was happening? 
was the 14th verse. Their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel. All right, who are you going to walk lockstep with, arm in arm? Is it your fellow man or is it with God? Who will you walk with? Who is right? What is right? Galatians chapter 1, Paul said in verse 10 as well, Or am I trying to please man still? If I were trying to please man still, I would not be a servant of Christ. You know, you can't serve two masters, Jesus said. You have to pick whether you serve God or serve Christ. Whether you serve God, I'm sorry, serve God or serve man. Whether you serve Christ or serve man. You have to choose. You can't choose two masters. You can't serve two masters. You trying to please God or you trying to please man? If you're trying to please man while serving God, you're fooling yourself. You can't be a servant of God while trying to please man. It can't be done. Which is what he said to Peter in Galatians 2, 17. But if we, if we, Peter, in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, were also found to be sinners, well, is Christ therefore a servant of sin? Certainly not. Peter is found to be a sinner. He's certainly sinning in this matter. He said, you know, Peter, you are an apostle and I am an apostle. The fact that you are doing this sin, does that make Christ a minister of sin, a servant of sin? Whose servant is it? Well, Christ won't serve sin. You can't change the truth. Just because you're an apostle doesn't mean you set the agenda. It's God's agenda. It's God's truth, no matter what you do personally. And that's the meaning of Romans 3 in the opening verses there. What if some of those inspired people who recorded the Old Testament were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? Well, may it never be. That you may be justified in your words and overcome when you are judged is a quotation from the 51st Psalm of David after he committed adultery and murder and was rebuked for his sin, proving that though he, proved, though he was unfaithful in that matter, God remained faithful and God's word remained trustworthy. All the vessels of God, chosen vessels of God, were imperfect. If anything perfect had come, then there would be no place sought for a second in Jesus Christ, to paraphrase Hebrews. All of them were imperfect in some way. If we were found to be sinners, would Christ become a servant of sin? Well, no. You can be no servant of Christ if you are serving man. It cannot be. He'll be true no matter what happens, even if all of us are liars. But you see what's happening there, I think, hopefully, clearly, that what it means is Galatians 1 and 2 are a call to obedience. He set up the principles, and the principles are valid and they apply to more than one thing. You know, they carry through the rest of that letter, and they're useful to us as general principles in teaching the gospel. That's true. But he very specifically intended for those things to apply to Peter. And it's obvious that Galatians 1, 6 through 10, form the outline of Galatians 2. It's exactly what he was saying to them is what happened, even if Peter does this. You don't follow him. Which is a hard thing to do. That's a principled stance because Peter is an apostle of the Lord. Ah, but that's why he said what he did. If they preach any, a gospel contrary to the one that has already been preached. The words of Peter in Acts 15 trump the words of Peter in Galatians 2. His personal 
choices thereafter, his own personal sin or hypocrisy following his inspired words is not relevant to the words that were inspired. They are the binding truth. But Peter, you know, this got personal. That is the apostle of the Lord who was given the keys. They knew him. They loved him. He had done many things. He had written this first letter, 1 Peter. But even he sinned. How can we be inoculated against that is, well, the way we can be inoculated against that, as Paul writes it, is that we don't follow personalities. We follow God through his word. We insist on book, chapter, and verse, no matter who is talking, no matter who is taking this action. And with this, Peter agrees. Did he take it personally? Well, he took and made the application to himself. He repented. We know that he agrees because of his second letter in the third chapter at the end of it. Second Peter 3, 15 and 16, he said, count the, patient, count the patience of our Lord. Peter said this, count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you, according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. Peter repented. Second Peter is the letter that comes at the end of his life when he realizes the putting off of his tent is near. Second Peter 1. Notice what he says. Count the patience of our Lord as salvation. And I want you to think about this in your own life because all of us need to obey the gospel. Whether for the first time, you know, or the hundredth time, we all have to repent. We all have to be right with God. We have to examine ourselves. Count the patience of our Lord to be salvation. First Peter did repent. But he said that God was being patient with him. Peter was given enough time acting the hypocrite like he was, doing wrong as he was, influencing others to do wrong as he was. Still, God's patience gave him enough time to be rebuked by Paul. God's patience saved Peter. Count the patience of the Lord to be salvation. Secondly, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you, Paul is beloved. The one who withstood him to his face and rebuked him with his own words, feeding them right back to him in front of everybody, is beloved. This one is beloved. Why? Because he was instrumental in Peter's salvation. Peter was sinning and he needed to know that so that he could repent, so that he could be forgiven. We are to be thankful for those who will stand up to us, who have the, the bravery, who have the principle, who have the discipline to follow the Lord, even if it means standing up to me and telling me that I'm wrong. They should be beloved. They should be respected and loved. They should be supported. These, he said, Paul wrote, according to the wisdom given to him. Meaning he did have the gospel. He did have the truth. And it's a good thing that he, Paul, was not in Jerusalem. It's a good thing that he was remote and that you could see the gospel, you know, some 14, 15 years in parallel, Paul teaching and the rest of the apostles teaching. 
so that when they come together 15 years later in Acts 15 and it's the same, that's objectivity. And Paul doesn't have the same ties to Jerusalem that Peter does. So when he shows up and he's acting like this, Paul sees it instantly and rebukes him. Just as Paul said in Galatians 1, I received it from the Lord directly. I didn't confer with anybody else. When I went to Jerusalem in Acts 15, it wasn't to settle this or because I had a question. I went because God told me to, because of a revelation. Remember he said that? And Peter also said, Paul does this in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. You know, all of his letters includes the letter to the Galatians. Peter is very well aware that his name is in there. His actions are in there. His rebuke and the sin that he committed, it's in there. He knows that. He has the letter to the Galatians, and he calls Paul beloved. That's good. That's the right response to the truth. I'm thankful for that. Anybody can be overtaken in a trespass. Anybody can get caught up in something. And God, because he is merciful, may well grant us the time to be woken up from that, to repent. But what will we do with it? You know, David was called a man after God's own heart. We referred to him earlier by way of Romans 3 and and, uh, Psalm 51. Why was he called a man after God's own heart? Because he repented when he was confronted with his sins. None of them were perfect, and none of us are perfect. But what do we do when we are confronted with the truth? That's the question. Do you know the truth today? Have you obeyed the gospel of Jesus today? If not, this is the day to do it. What will you do with that truth? Will you obey him? Will you put Jesus on in baptism for forgiveness of sins, in simple trusting faith, plunging yourself beneath the water, putting to death the old person of sin and burying them together with him, that you might be raised from there a new creation in Christ Jesus, created in him for good works, which God prepared beforehand for us to walk in. Ephesians 2.10. Is that where you are? We have water prepared that you might obey the gospel before it's too late. Are you a Christian like Peter who's been in sin? Repent. God has shown enough mercy and patience to let you live this long that you might be able to turn. Don't spurn the gift of God, the grace of God that has granted us time to this day. If today you need the prayers of the saints, we'll pray with you. If you need to obey the gospel, let your need be known now by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song selected.